So um, this is me standing in the Menengal Tal in Eastern Mongolia. Um, this photograph was taken by my translator that helped me get there. <laughs> His name was Mungbo. So I'm gonna just tell you how I ended up in Eastern Mongolia on the Menengal Tal and kind of how my work um, got to where it is where I look at vast open landscape as kind of the subject of my work. So I wanted to start with those two kind of as the introduction, and then I'm gonna play an animation. What you're looking at right now is an animation that's like a seven minute loop, and it came after I was in Mongolia. And this landscape right here is actually in Nebraska. So I was born and raised in Northeast, like central Nebraska, kind of where the sand hills end and like farmland begins. And um, I, when I was young, when I was 18, I ended up marrying into this trucking and ranching family. And it was a little unexpected. I had scholarships to study art and it, that's what happened. So anyway, I found myself in a semi truck shortly thereafter and I drove a truck for seven years. And so I hauled cattle only cattle um, throughout the entirety of the Great Plains from starting in central Nebraska all the way to like Northwest Montana to the tip of Texas. And um, I find it interesting to be here and hear about fishing because, because we only hauled cattle and lived on a ranch. Um, it had a similar like cycle that was related to life cycles of cattle. And so we had this like intense period in the fall where we drove thousands and thousands and thousands of miles because that's when all the cattle move out of ranch land into like, you know, farm country where they'll feed them. Um, and then like in the spring, they do these pasture halls where you're really going like 10 miles. It's, it's, it's not fun at all. It just takes all day because you're hauling babies <laughs> and mothers. And, um, and then in between, there's like the fat little so. My parents um, were teachers and like kind of really creative people. And I wasn't quite expecting to land a life like that. But so when I got there, I just went all in. I was like, okay, so here I am. <laughs> so I became a pretty good truck driver. Um, and driving all that way really formed how I saw the world, I realized later, um, because it's just, monotonous and long and you know you're driving thousands of miles with just that landscape moving behind beside you and I was so excited to be there and all I wanted to do is study art and have the time to make art because I was in college and that's not the real world you know so you have time <laughs> you're just doing this thing and so um and I had seen the work of William Kentridge if you're familiar with him he's from South Africa and I saw his work in a retrospective in Chicago um, the first year of school. And I was like, whoa, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like it was moving drawing. And um, and it was really impactful. So that next fall, I was like, like just having a moment one day in class. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna do that. So I set about figuring out how to animate uh, the way he animated. So I literally just watched tapes of his work, trying to understand how it worked to move images that way. <laughs> I didn't take an animation class. We didn't really have an animation department. But that that animation did pretty well. It paid for graduate school. And so, um, but it, uh, like all the things I had to say around it and um, the way it was presented was very much like social social awareness or social justice. And so when I finally got to graduate school at the University of Michigan, um, I was like, find myself at the top of parking garages where I could see like this really wide open space. Because even though Ann Arbor is not deeply forested like Northern Minnesota or Alaska, like it still is not like the plains, which is so open. So um, the first fall that I was there, we read as you do in graduate uh, classes, this, this philosophy and there's this, this sentence, this sentence got me a long ways. <laughs> and it said, um, that is why smooth space is occupied by intensities, wind and noise, 
horses, and sonorous and tactile qualities as in the desert, steppe, or ice. And for me, like the whole article was called The Smooth and the Striated. And essentially is like how we take something that's really unknown, break it down into manageable pieces. And then it comes back to a greater place of like smoothness for us. But that, like, I understood that all through the lens of driving and being on the planes, you know, like I just understood it in this really intuitive way. And then, so then I got obsessed with like, where's the step? I need to go to the step, you know? <laughs> so like a couple months after that, I was like, I need to go to Mongolia, you know, like, so Mongolia and the Great Plains are exactly opposite on the planet. And so um, I found this, this group out of Bozeman, Montana that goes every year. It's called the Bioregions Expedition. It's led by a professor there. And they do like soil science research and field hospitals and all this stuff. And I was like, so they were awesome. And they've been going there for several years. And um, so I tagged along. And um, at the end of that trip, we were in Northern Mongolia, like a good part of it. We were there a couple of months. Um, I hired a driver and a translator to take me to Eastern Mongolia, the place that Lonely Planet said looked the most like Nebraska search at 1886, which is like pre-settlement, right? So I was like so interested to see this landscape that looks like my home landscape, but doesn't have the same, um, you know, like structure of what settlement did and what the Jefferson grid did, you know, cause I grew up on the grid. And so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do it. So I get a, I find this driver and this translator and take off for Eastern Mongolia. And it was really hard because like, they're not at that time, there weren't very good roads. It's like driving through pastures and, and it poured rain and it was like flooding and we got stuck all day one day in these mud flats. And, and I was like, oh, this is just, this is hard. <laughs> and so, um, we get to this city in Eastern Mongolia. And um, I was like, oh, like, I'm not very welcome here. Like, the, I, I could see it, you know, I was like, oh, okay. All right. So fine. We'll just, we'll just get through this. And then the next day we were going to go to the Menengotal, which is a flat step, but it's a protected area by the, by the government. And so we uh, go driving along and like, you know, they're like dirt paths. Well, the driver took this one instead of this one. And so we ended up on the northernmost part, which is um, seven miles from the Chinese border. So there's all these military checkpoints out there. <laughs> but like we're going through these checkpoints and they're fine. You know, like obviously everything's fine. But at the time they weren't really translating. I didn't know what they were talking about. And it's all just kind of intense. And so we go through two and then we get out to this place to camp. And that's where we're close to the Chinese border and we go off into the grasslands, which is where that photograph is. I just, by then was a little stressed, I think, you know, that was a lot of stressful travel. And then I could see in the distance, like there's mirage, right? On the horizon when you're in a vast place like that. And I was like, I went off to draw. And then when I was drawing, I was like, I think somebody came to camp. Like I, I walked like probably a mile and a half away. They like, somebody come to camp. I was like, would they invite somebody to stay at camp when we're just me by myself, you know? And like the and so like I become like convinced of this, and it's reinforced by this experience in this really open landscape where there's just absolutely nowhere to go. You can't you can't have any illusion that you have any kind of self protection in a moment where you're in a landscape where you're very vulnerable, and then there's like social and political things happening around you because you know this is a foreigner in a different land and, and so I was like okay so I'm in that space and I walk back to camp and of course nobody was there it's all in my mind and the two guys that I hired were great you know they're great people but it was just a really intense space to be in reinforced by land and vulnerability for myself and then that night, like there was a full moon out there on the step and it was just like amazing. So we turned around the next day and then made, it took three days to get there and it was like 180 miles. 
the kid just wasn't very far. <laughs> it was just so that is probably the single best thing that could have happened to me to help me understand what it's like to be um, the foreigner, to understand what it is to be white and not in privilege, to be in a landscape that um, where you're displaced and not in power or control. So anyway, so, and nobody knew I was out there. <laughs> so, like my husband didn't know I was out He didn't even know that story till I gave my thesis talk like seven months later. So anyway, like it all worked out good, it's fine. So this is the drawings from there. This, this actual one right here is this. So when I get back, I think, okay, that was not quite as I imagined it would be. And I need to drive back out to the Great Plains and go through my truck routes. So I get my car, go to Nebraska, I go to my mom's and like I take off on my old truck routes up through South Dakota and um, South Dakota, the bottom corner of, or the top corner of Wyoming, bottom of Montana and then cut up the circle and then back through North Dakota. And I was gonna go back to Minnesota where my mother-in-law lived. And I did like two nights in a hotel and I'm just driving. That's all I'm doing. Stopping to photograph, but I just wanted to drive. And when I, this, after the night in North Dakota, I get in my car and I start driving back to Minnesota and I just have this like panic set in. I was like, something's wrong. Like, what's wrong? And I was like, I, I'm not supposed to leave. I just knew with all of my being that I wasn't supposed to leave. And that like, I needed to really think about that landscape as the subject of what I need to make work about. So I figured this out like, you know, 50 miles from Minnesota. So I'm almost all the way there because this is like a six hour drive. <laughs> and so I get to my mother-in-law's house and I walk and she's like, what's going on with you? I was like, I have to go back. <laughs> so I had to go get new tires, get them on my car and I go back to North Dakota for a week and I'm like camping by myself at Theodore Roosevelt. And this is like before the oil boom, like everybody knows the oil boom mm -hmm. is happening. And so like I'm driving back roads like I was taught to do as a kid and like stopping and getting out and drawing. And like, there's like these pickups driving by that are like, what are you doing? Like, I was like, I didn't know this was a thing, you know, cause I had Michigan plates. I didn't have a Nebraska plate or anything. So after that, I was like, this is, this is it. This is the core of my work. And those understandings came as time has gone by, but like I set up for myself the question, which is like, how do I interpret in visual artistic form the experience of vast open landscape? And the starting point is the plains. It can extend out from there. I worked with Mongolia, um, but that is essentially where it, the shaping of it. So this animation, by the way, has six locations, Mongolia, uh, two in North Dakota, and three in Nebraska. And then there's more work that came um, from that too. I like to exhibit it larger. Uh -huh. So I'll, I'll show you that. Um, I'm gonna back up just a second to show you these prints because there was a lot of work leading up to this understanding, you know? Um, so this is a woodcut print, color reduction woodcut print. So prior to going to Mongolia, I was trying to make these prints and there was this printmaker that did a studio visit with me at Michigan and I had been making them and just lining them up next to one another. He's like, why don't you just put them on one piece of paper? And I was like, well, how am I gonna do that? And he's like, well, just put it under the roller. So this is like a 20 foot roll of Japanese mulberry rice paper. And then I have like a 38 inch wide block. And so, um, what I would do is I would um, roll it under the roller, like, so I'd have it tubed on both sides of the top of the press. And then I would print. And then as I lifted it up, I'd roll it up, print, and then roll it, and continue to roll it. And it's a color reduction. And so there's just one wood block that gets carved down to make it. So there's only one print. Um, and this, there's more that was informing what I was doing because, um, about the time I made these, the first class I had at Michigan that was a non-art class was with um, was a women's oral history class. And in that class um, was this woman named Angela Parker. And she is Mandan and Hidatsa. And 
her um, people are from North Dakota and we became really good friends. And we, part of our connection was the plains. So we had this similar shared land that formed our understandings of things, you know? And I just loved her. Like she's also one of my friends, you know, but it's like started with this connection, I think around land. And um, she's a scholar in history and herself is doing great work. Um, but we were having lunch one day and I was like telling her how I thought about uh, how, since I grew up on the grid, um, where I, the small area where I was from, small town area, like people would associate sections with people, right? So there would be farms, farms where people didn't live anymore perhaps, um, and, but it didn't matter because whoever had lived there like 50 years ago, that's how you referenced the place was by their name. You know, and so like I was interested how we recorded memory of place by naming it in our like, and it was based on the grid essentially and those farms that were laid out on the grid and just how memory is tied to place like specific place, but it gets recalled through other, other methods. And so she's like, oh, well, you need to read this book called Wisdom Sits in Places by Keith Basso. And it's about the Western Apache and their way of um, place. Like this whole culture is built on stories that sit in places. <laughs> and so like in the course of a conversation, it could be like a teaching story or just a story story, or it could serve multiple levels, but like as a teaching mechanism, even they could just name a place and the person would know the story that's tied to that place and that would inform someone. And so I was so fascinated by that, you know? And so that was pre-Mongolia. So part of the premise of going to Mongolia was also that I was interested to see like did people there also think this way, especially in open landscapes where there just are no markers, you know, like it's really subtle if there's markers there's not a lot of buildings, there's no mountains or rock formations very much. I mean, there are, but there are fewer. So that was leading up to going to Mongolia. So these are the prints that I made about that time. And there were five spots across the plains that I did them. This is out by Chimney Rock. So I liked these prints. Okay, so back to the uh, animation you were watching. So this is an installation of that animation. Um, and I was really lucky to be able to have this set up and it was in this black box video studio. So that is 60 feet across and it was like on a curve. And so it was like, I don't know, 15 feet higher or something like that. And so it has three channels, um, but it was, I, and then here you can kind of see the three channels, there's the three different landscapes. So the idea was that um, I call, it's called the distance of horizon. And then like each drawing that made the animation um, is got the same horizon line. And so what changes is just everything beneath that horizon line. And then you list, and then you have to pay attention to detail and subtlety to understand that it's a different place. So that's the Mongolian step. And then that's to give a sense of scale. That's, you know, when I started making that, I just knew I was going to animate and I knew somehow I was going to project them. But this woman that was running the video studio or she was doing media um, at Michigan and she walked in and saw the drawings and she's the person that said, oh, you should go see about the video studio. And, and then like, it was helpful because I wouldn't have thought of that. And then so because I had that opportunity, I could see what was possible. And um, that's what was possible. Mm. Okay, so that same animation, I had this idea that I wanted to project it at the site of the drawings where they come from. Because I was thinking so much about memory and history and how we attach those things to places. Um, and ultimately I've gotten to a place where I don't include that in never in a gallery setting um, because that wouldn't make any sense because this is my memory, my history. Um, but when I took it out to the land, it felt okay to do that. So that that was a drawing of my grandmother from her photographs from the thirties. Um, 
because they've been there since the 20s. And and then in this one, you can see that the so I just <laughs> projector on a milk crate or something, I don't know, out in the field. I So this is the most fun work for me to make, this, this stuff. Did you have people come to the site and view it? Not this time, because I was like, um, I was a little nervous. <laughs> Because I was like, I'm gonna go out there and do this, and I didn't meet a lot of people. Like, I just wanted to see how I thought about it once I did it. Later, I do it where there's people watching. I was also like uh, four months pregnant, and it was like taking me everything to get this done. But um, I got it. And then, question? yeah. So you mentioned that you lined that up intentionally so the horizon part yeah. aligns with the actual. The first photo you showed of you with your your the friend went next to you as oh your head was yeah. that intentional did you ask your your guide to do that or no he just took the picture, that, took the picture that. that way and i think i realized later like he really i think he was actually very creative and he could kind of see mm -hmm. you know the way artists can see because <laughs> when we got done with the being stuck for like six hours him and the driver got us out by putting the mud flaps underneath of the wheels. It took six hours to get out. It was really bad. He was like, why didn't you take a picture? <laughs> I was like, I was just trying to stay out of the way. But like, I think in his mind, you know, he was able to like compose a picture and a story out of that. So no, that was not intentional. He did that. But these, when I lined these up, this is exactly where I stood to, to get the drawing. This is at my grandma's farm. This is my grandma on the left and my mom. And, and like, this was really powerful because um, it was really emotional for her to see. So there's also some drawings of my grandfather, and my great grandfather, and um, just different things. And so like, that was where art was able to touch her, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was good. And then every time I've done these outdoor things, I have to have a lot of help. So my sister and my friend from graduate school, and she's like carrying her baby, and like I just like to include them because I needed their help to make it happen. So I'm gonna move on and jump ahead now in time. Okay, so this um, is a drawing on paper. It's not an animation, and so the two side panels are five feet wide, and the middle one is seven feet wide, and. Um, and it's made on a scroll like that so that I could adjust to the size of a space it was in, you know, like by the ceiling height. Um, and this was at the Great Plains Art Museum. And this is when I kind of started focusing on um, the Sage Creek area. And that kind of came about, um, I thought I wanted to go back to Theodore Roosevelt the North Coda because I had a grant and I was going to go do like field research, but um, it made more sense somehow to go to the Badlands. And that made sense because when I was a truck driver, the route we often drove was up through like um, uh, Rosebud and up to the interstate and then across. And so the Badlands were always like right there. And I was really fascinated by that place. And I always kind of wanted to just pull off and go there. And then when I uh, my first marriage ended, there was this couple that helped me a lot in that space before I got to school. And they camped at Sage Creek most of their adult lives. So they had been camping out there for like 50 years or something, 40, 50 years. And, and their names are Alan Marsh and Musson. But so it was an important place to them and they kind of introduced me to that. And so it's part of my, my story too. So, and it's public land. So, <laughs> like that's an important factor when you're on the plains, like places that you can access that are public and you, you know, don't have to ask permission or whatnot to get there and be there really. This is another drawing. And, the, and so one thing about these, the placement of the horizon line is really specific to height, you know, so this is like five and a half feet, kind of a pretty average eye line height. This one's higher, so you get a sense of like kind of being in it when the horizon is above you. This is them. This is the MCAD in Minneapolis showing together. And this was I had a McKnight Fellowship in 2013, and so this was for the exhibition that went with that. 
And so with that Magnite Fellowship, I did the next round of the animation about landscape. And I'll show you the animation too, but um, the core focus for me with that was to go take it out to the landscape and show it there because I really loved doing that and I wanted to do it again. And so at Sage Creek, it's this like circle campground that has these weird wagon wheel picnic shelters. <laughs> so it's crazy. But they work well with the sun and um because it's really hot out there. And so every night it's really barren. It's like sage brush out there. And it's on the west side of Badlands. And so it's off of the route that people drive through when they're just wanting to see the Badlands, you know. But we camped out there and that's where Ella Marcia had camps and every night that thing fills with people because they know it's a free campground. Mm -hmm. um, they pull in off the interstate and they're from everywhere, like all over the world, people pull into that campground. So part of me was like, well, like this is a way to do this project where there are going to be people, you know, like, and, and really interesting people that are just appearing. <laughs> and so in 2014, I did this. And so I worked with the park service and um, got permission and all of that stuff so that I could do this over the course of a week. And I did it every night. And this is my son. So for this one though, what I didn't like about the other one is the sound of the generator to run the projector. So I have a solar generator that would run it. And like it had about a two hour battery. And so that was good because that was about the amount of time you have from like dusk till dark. So it's about the amount, right amount of time to project. I just like this blurry photo of this. It shows you kind of how to set up. So the screen was like 10 by 12 or so. Um, but I liked how there was like so much serendipity in the way that it interacted with the environment. This one I included um, drawings of things from that place. So I have buffalo, um, which you see regularly when you camp there, very close. And I have, um, a, so there used to be a Great Plains grizzly, which I thought was like, I was just fascinated with it because they're not there anymore because they got killed. But um, I was like, that would just be terrible out here <laughs> to have to deal with a big grizzly in the Badlands. There's a picture of that. But they're extinct because of settlement. So. And I don't think ranchers would like them. So this, I, so I did, uh, each night I kind of did a different spot. And so you can see that drawing is that formation. Um, and it was like lots of weather out there. Just, I wanted you to see kind of what it looks like setting up. And my friend from graduate school came again to help me because she's awesome. Mm -hmm. She deserves a lot of acknowledgement. Her name is Adrian Butter. She lives in Wyoming with my, and that's my crew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. so you drew and then you projected the drawing. Yeah, the animation. Yeah. And how big was the drawing? The, the drawing that made the animation was about like 20 by 15 or so. Mm -hmm. Was it graphite? Yes. So the very first animation I did was all charcoal. And um, later on, I was like, I just realized that I liked the finesse of graphite, you know? Like I liked this more subtle qualities. And um, to me, it's beauty beautiful and kind of easier to manipulate. It's just through the evenings. But people, okay, this is a story for you, Annette, because Okay, so um, this night, I'm doing this projection, and I am not making up any detail of this story. I am like, it's dark, there's so many people there, and um, like, people are funneling in as it's being projected, and some people were coming up to see it, and that was fascinating, and that's when I realized I needed, this, really needed assistance to do this, because it required talking to people a lot, like, why are you doing this? But this man like walks out of the grass and he's like naked to his waist 
he has a bear claw necklace on he has long hair and I'm like who what and then he's like so I need to know why you're doing this and like he was so irritated it was just like so irritated. Face. Yeah, I made it not a pristine wilderness for him. And the part of it though, I, after talking to him, like him and his wife lived in Maryland and they had just come out of the Wyoming mountains where they had been horseback riding for like six weeks. Mm-hmm. So they're like already re-entering society and um, not happy about this <laughs> and he like just kept drilling me like he wouldn't stop and finally I was like look I grew up like just over there like it's like not very far away and I drove truck out here and I drove by here and oh he was like oh this is your home I was like yeah and he's like I really thought this was just like an art gimmick and I was like (sighs) and so (laughs) that was the trip like I was like okay I have to be think about that you know why why to do this and actually the last night I was there I didn't set up because there was just like this hush feeling I was like I'm I'm not doing this tonight it's not it's not right so um I'm not there to disrupt wilderness for people but but also I want people to think about it you know I want people to think about land and like how they're um, seeing it so the animation for that, it's, I might just play that kind of at the end. It's 24, mi- 24 minutes long. And I love this one, by the way. <laughs> it's like my favorite shot. And Adrian got that one actually. So um, that animation, then I had an exhibition opportunity at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. They have a good program for Minnesota artists. And um, so there's a large gallery that was dedicated for Minnesotans and I got selected. And so then I took the same animation, but then I kind of like made it for a gallery setting because in the land, the animation could function differently. You know, I wanted people, I was showing people the land that was there and like my walks back into like the more remote areas. Um, but the land was part of the project and so this for this i wanted it to be immersive you know like that first animation you saw and be about the land so it's just like this really long slow 24 minutes of moving around um that landscape and trying to think So this is the circle, but I took all the picnic shelters out. I kind of like just take out the stuff that we put there <laughs> when I make the drawings, except for the road. I thought the road was interesting. Um, this is, you know, the way that the earth out there gets cracked and dry. Um, there's this place out away from there that I like to hike to or walk to. And um, there's, this is a really interesting it's a hard place you know because when you're I'm there it's really hot always and uh, it's just different being in that landscape um I've been asked about this and so I'll address it also and one is I at least am not ever unaware of the history of that place and for example you know when you're driving the Badlands Loop there's the Bigfoot Pass but that literally is the pass where Bigfoot had to walk through to get to Wounded Knee. And, you know, that's like story of a massacre. And so that area and that region is, you know, the site of so much um, atrocity, right? And so being out there for me, like, it's not just like this happy, everything is like beautiful and perfect or pristine. Like there's a, there's a feeling in the land itself, I think that you can sense or I can sense. But at the same time, it's this landscape that I just love and um, feel like I belong to, like it's not mine, but I'm from there. And so that's how I am shaped in this world. And so um, that's just part, I think that goes into the drawing. You know, I don't think, I don't think you can have those experiences and not have it come out in your work. 
So this was 26 feet wide and 14 feet tall. And I kind of liked it. It was like a tunnel to the end of there. This was at the MIA, the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Oh, that's just a still frame of the first one, which is over by the Ben Rifle Center. And then, so this is the more current work I've been doing. And so this is um, uh, okay. So these are like four rolls of paper, and then I have these animations that are like four sites through a walk through the mounds area in Badlands. And then um, they're all animations. And then I pro projected them to look like they are tight to the paper. So the drawings, it's more like a drawing that's moving as opposed to just a projection on a wall. Um, I really like this, this um, installation. And then, so I'm starting to investigate night because you know I do so much that's just black and white, but um, uh, darkness and night was a huge part of driving a truck. And so a lot of my work was done at night. Mm -hmm. A lot of my experience of landscape is at night. And so I'm trying to like, and just starting to like drill down into that and how to portray it and, and things like that. And so with this animation, I was really trying to work on adding that color and adding that sense of uh, luminosity and nighttime. And so there's less like moving grasses and stuff and more just like moving land um, that shape it. And then this is a different installation done in this place called the Free Range Film Barn in Northern Minnesota. It's a big old barn that um, is just so cool. It's like being on the inside of a whale or something. It's got like, you see just all the structure mm -hmm. and it was built in the thirties. And um, my friend, Annie, She's a curator, but she married into this organic farm that's been there a long time. And they have this barn. She's like, okay, I'm going to make it into a film festival and do art projects there. And so it was really fun. So I was working with some more just like lines, like these are all moving and, and, uh, trying to kind of explore abstraction because sky is a really abstract thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to work on that, like night and sky, uh, which are in equal parts to land. You know, they both shape your experience. Are these marks made by your hand? Yeah, I drew them. They're digital, but I did draw them. So this is the actual drawing. There's an ink, ink and graphite that made those animations. I just, I really like, so right now in the last little while, like through the pandemic and stuff, I've been doing a lot of just drawing, but part of it is trying to um, work on this night and color and understand kind of how to move forward with that in, in all things, you know. So you know what I think I'll do is I'm going to put this other animation up. We can talk. <laughs> so you, were you drawing when you were driving the truck? I was. Um, well, you've always been on. Yeah, I, I've always seen myself as an artist since I was young. So you really have to hold on tight to that idea yeah. sometimes. <laughs> I didn't feel like I was an artist for a long time, but I'm like, I think I am. <laughs> Yeah, it took a long time to like, get back to going to school, but you yeah. were doing artwork. I was doing artwork the whole time I was in that life. I would have a drawing going at home, and I would never show those drawings ever, ever. But like, just the idea of having them to do kept me going, you know, like kept me going through really hard spaces and times. How large were those when you were drawing? Well, I remember I did this one that was like this, and it was oh. all colored pencil. Yeah. Like they weren't they weren't small. Yeah. So beautiful. I'm just kind of thinking about when you project the pieces in the night into the night and on location. I'm thinking about how you want people to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. You're trying to so they're there mm -hmm. and they're surrounded by the 
open spaces, but maybe they're not taking it in. Yeah. So you underline it. Yeah. Can people talk to you about the reactions that were seeing it. Just the guy that was really, you know, like everybody else was really fascinated and they thought it was really cool. And like they, but it was, it was the skeptic that really was willing to push me. So I would guess more than him probably felt that way. Maybe. I don't know. It's good to have people question. Yeah. Because it makes you think. Yeah. Sometimes it's a little harsh though. <laughs> it is a little harsh. But sometimes when I've talked about it, because this is what it feels like, um, and actually, I should back up and say a curator said this to me once, and then it's like, oh, yeah, that's what it is, because I'm just moving from a place of intuition, and she said, um, she's actually from Canada, like, she's kind of from a lot, like, Canada up towards Alaska, her name's Candace Hopkins, and she's an indigenous woman that works with a lot of like probably place-based art so maybe that's why she could understand it um but she said that it was a gesture and I was like oh yes because it feels like a gesture or like a prayer like you know like prayer in this other way like to land mm -hmm. and to your home and mm -hmm. that's what it feels like for me because it's so fun I love doing it but it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. And there was no, I mean, it's not, uh, did you have a grant? Did you have any funding to experiment with the landscape? I had grants along the way. I spent more than the grants. But... <laughs> because yeah. by the time I decided to do the Sage Creek stuff, I was so sure that I needed and wanted to do it, that I was going to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So. So I want to know the least of you. Like, <laughs> your, your story about, or do you teach otherwise, or is this your work? This is what you do. This is what I do. And so I just want to know more about, you know, it takes a special kind of exhibition space. Uh -huh. for that. And, and then what? Do, do the individual shows move or do they just get stored or what? Well, what so the lucky work? thing is that it stores really well. <laughs> it's pretty easy. And then even though, the, even though, okay, so even those prints I showed you, well, okay, first of all, uh, like, no, they don't travel. Like, I'm not like apparently so awesome yet that people are just like you know beating on my door to make them travel around but and I'm also maybe not pushy enough to like get out there and make that happen yeah. but um so it, worthy of being seen. <laughs> thank you but so along with this idea of like some of my ideas about going to Mongolia were like kind of on the romantic side but I should clarify I'm not a romantic about land you know um I was like well people move and I realized later, like, I moved. That's how I existed in land, is I moved through it, right? Because I built a truck. I was never in the wrong place. Like, you know, you go home, but then you leave all the time. And I was like, I want to make work that's easy to move. So, like, those woodcut prints are those 20-foot rolls that roll up. And the things that hold them are boxes made out of the blocks. And, like, the large drawings roll up and they store as rolls. You know, so I, I like it. I like that the artwork is... I like making it easy to move around. So, yeah. I got off the track there. So when you roll, like I'm just thinking of the graphite, and as you roll it up, it, there must be a layer that separates it from. Just on the layer. horizon, as long as you roll once and you roll tight, oh, it'll then it, it'll be okay. I usually roll it myself, obviously. So I would not be a good museum person because I'm not precious. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not precious enough with things like I'm like it'll be fine <laughs> I know it'll you know it'll so, be fine I love your movement. movement I do too I love everything that puts you alive and brings you to the land so there must be a ditch do people just walk on you see this online or I just, well, not, I mean, yes, but I don't think it carries the same as an installation it, because you have to be like at this kind of human scale to really understand the movement even. 
you know. So. You review it in your like a workspace. Yeah, I have a projector in my Duluth studio that like it's about this big. It'll. Oh, it's so it's so essential. Yeah, it is essential. The scale. Have you ever sold your drawings? Yeah, I have sold the oh. drawings. Mm -hmm. so. Because once you <laughs> they store well. <laughs> they store well, yeah. So yeah, I have sold the drawings. I think that was another question I was wondering. Is, so, uh, uh, so <laughs> largely this is not retail. This is yeah, right. This is it has to be more. commissioned or you yeah. know invited to a space that right. will pay the right. Yeah. Well, this is just more of this, so it changes. This is different than the first one. This is more like moving through the place than just like looking at different. Um... So this is, I said 24 minutes long, but I was told that because people did this, um, it's the same as like a meditation sit. And so people would go into that gallery at MIA and they would meditate to this, which I thought I would like. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It doesn't move. Yeah. So you're doing all the drawings on site as well. Well, I do reference drawings. You know, like because the animations obviously take a long time. I mean, I spend months doing that. But everything I draw, I I is a place that I've sat to draw and photograph. So I have both references. It's just so old school. <laughs> so the drawings, like maybe they're 15 by 20 and then I have a camera mounted above the drawing table. And then I make a, this is, I'm gonna back it up just to show you. So I draw and erase the movement. And so um, like all of these laser graphs are drawn and I photograph. I erase each one and then I redraw it next to where it was to make it easy. So like it goes here. <laughs> it's a time lapse of a single drawing and Yep. Oh, draw and erase and draw and erase and draw and erase. Yeah. Oh. By Kentridge. And so I sent this. And I'm sure you guys have seen the I mean I any museum in the book like this. Yeah. At this point, he was one of the most recognizable yep. animator, visual artist with projection. Yeah. Very suited to your mm -hmm. and, and there isn't a good one. We be, be more influenced by Thanks. You know, there's a yeah. pattern you can include these other yeah. filmmakers, but as a visual artist. And Follow up on that. I think I told you the story, but I, I met William Kentridge um, at a talk because I had made the first animation. And I told him, anyway, he was a very kind, humble, wise person, too. You know, so everything that comes out in his work is in him, I think. And he gave me his address and he wanted me to send it to him. So I sent him the first one. So I had his address. And then after I did this work and the planes, I just wrote to him again. And I thanked him because it's so influential, you know. And he's just so nice. He's like, I sent him a letter. And he emailed me back and was like, this is great way to be an animator. You know, it, he wasn't like protective or territorial because also it's very different, you know, what's happening in the work. But um, uh, he's so, he's a good influence, you know, like as an artist too, like as a person. Mm -hmm. It's just a great sheer concept. I mean, you know, like where his work started by it's probably similar to yours, but it's a truck driving. Yeah. So far, it's very good. Yeah. Is completely affected by the South African uh, political experience mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s. And it's only way to do that is to, to animate. 
yeah. Very constant and his, his yeah. perception of it. And very emotionally, politically charged uh, mm -hmm. visual experiences. And, and in that, the yeah. whole thing manner, and now you working with the landscape in that same way. It's like, it's not that you have, your ears isn't politically charged in any capacity to, to, to like death and like people dying in that way, but people have died. Yeah. And like, and right. There is so much transference to, own, to minimalist, like nothing, you know, about yeah. that experience. It's, it's a really, it's a very good job and a good animal. Thanks, Michael. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say that, you know, the first animation I made, like the other thing that captivated me, captivated me about his work was that he was doing the, this really charged work, right? About And that fit what I was trying to talk about, you know, from this experience of rural Nebraska. And in the end, I think I more aligned with what he was doing when I got to my own work, talking about this land that has the sight of this, but is really invisible, you know? Thinking over time, the way this work might be perceived is actually um, like you know, I I come to it as a person who likes that kind of relationship to the yes, or, yeah, you know, the page and the sensuality and the mark and the detail that's happening in the animation with the objects and the system. But there's something about the vastness and the delicateness and the emptiness and the sense of like trace um like the landscape is an artifact yeah left. um like um this i think about we are going to think about the united states we're in a process now we need to start to talk about this we're going to start thinking about the united states in a way that is getting it's going to be more and more. And we are the first generation to really wake up to the responsibility of setting it and witness. And you're witnessing something yeah. that doesn't um, project too much emotion, but holds this vast space that has like, a sense of it. It makes you think about it and what it is doing. Yeah. It's also interesting you. that you mentioned I'm curious to hear more of why, um, not just on the answer, but you were raised with it, you chose to not draw pigment other than the world to be the empty of that. What's can you talk more about why? So when I first started with that and the idea of like drawing these histories into the animations, I was like watching them and I was thought this doesn't work because this is a didactic version of this history. Like I can't draw, that's just one history. And like what I appreciate about land is how like, if you know the land, especially like a, like a rise or a hill or a spot will recall a memory for oneself. And like by eliminating any um, placed narratives or history that allows that to be read by the person that comes to it and so I have to say like my friend Angela Parker mm -hmm. and like so I was just clueless like I mean not cl not clueless because I didn't care like you just you know just growing up in that landscape living there and um driving it is a sense of belonging and you <laughs> just like the history taught as a kid you're like it's just this fresh new narrative, right? And, um, but I always could, as a, I remember as a kid thinking something's not, something doesn't make sense here, you know, because we drive by, we have reservations and there's quite a few close to where, and I just was like kind of confused, but not, I wasn't saying that out loud. I just remember having those like responses. And then by the time I got to graduate school, like I was going through a momentous change, you know, <laughs> like going from being a truck driver to being at the, you know, an undergraduate and then getting into Michigan where I was like, what? The? You know, like, how did I land here? I have no idea. I mean, I did know because I picked it, but like, I just felt so, but then I had really good friends, like my friend Angela, who I mentioned, you know, like, we're just kind that didn't come up, but it was a way of like, 
I was given kindness to understand these things about colonialism and land. So I'm really lucky, you know. And then now I look back and I go, what did I say? I probably said so many, you know, things that were not helpful, but I didn't do it because I meant to, you know. Yeah, it's it, it's um, it's unsettling. It's unsettling. Yeah. Even though it's about the implies it and nostalgic for the thing, but it's negative and uncomfortable and so Yeah. Well, yeah, it's true. It was a great conversation. In a weird way. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it was uncomfortable. It really was kind of like said, but there was that powerful thing. I mean, it showed you now the next time. Yeah. You know, it's just like. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it was too. It probably also helped you with that. Yeah, I know. I was <laughs> like, and you live where? Right. Maryland? Right. With your horses? Sure. <laughs> Don't be in here. <laughs> it was fine. I mean, I was a truck driver. I encountered a lot of intense people. <laughs> but at the moment, it was, you know, when you show work anyway, you're pretty vulnerable. And so there's that just like being on the edge anyway. And it's so, uh, um, so now we live in just on my life story since that's where I started, I'm kind of in Micronesia. Where this. So we live in northern Minnesota. Um, my husband, we both live very different lives. Like he actually spent a lot of time in Alaska in his twenties and fished. And I think he had a lot of, he had met a lot of uh, indigenous people along the way that were friends to him and kind of helped like jog his worldview. And, and then by the time we got back up to Duluth, our son was just a baby and he started his college degree when he was 40. Um, Cause he'd spent his life kind of traveling and working. And so he he has interest areas where he's studying um, like political science and um, American Indian studies as ways of like understanding policy and how our worlds, you know, intersect. I don't want to speak too much for him. I don't do that. <laughs> but just to give you a general sense of that. And so our son was in and um, it happened because we needed a place for our son. Like we were in like a desperate situation, like with childcare, but we knew about this program because we had seen a clip on the public television station and he knew about it through the program he was in. And he landed in the Ojibwe Moen um, immersion program. So he was in that from preschool until fifth grade. And that was such a gift for our family. Like it was a gift given to us and it was good for our son. And he learned like a different worldview from the time he was four. And um, we made really good friends in that program. And so we've just like, you, you get to learn to step back, <laughs> you know, and be uncomfortable a lot. And just, um, just keep trying. That's just kind of like our life story. So anyway, so I think I probably talked enough. <laughs> Yeah. Right. She's it was so random too. Like we just happened to be in class together. But I went to this party the first night of sorry to back up, talk about listening to that voice. Went to this party the first night before graduate school. And this other person that was in the MFA program was like, oh, hey, I'm taking this class. It's just like women's oral history. She goes, this should be good. You should take it. And I was like, I'm going to take that class. And like I switched classes, signed up for that class because I just knew I needed to take that class. And it was great. I did the oral history with my grandmother, which is where those photographs came from that made those drawings, and met Angela, you know, which was just a gift. <laughs> what did she write about now? Well, she... Um, a lot of her work was based on, um, sorry, Angel, the dam in North Dakota where they dammed the Missouri, mm -hmm. and then they took all of the good land that they had. Mm -hmm. 